joining us today. We're uh, very happy to have you here for this uh, EU Taxonomy webinar. And uh, we especially uh, glad that, that so many of you have signed up given the, the flood of EU taxonomy webinars that's happening right now. And uh, I think that A shows that there's a lot of information need, but also of course, a lot of discussion need. Um, there have been a lot of really good webinars already out on this by also some of our colleagues from other companies. And, and so even though we're going to be um, also giving an introduction to the EU taxonomy a little bit more broadly, we want to focus a little bit more on the implications we see for sustainability management. And that's also why we have brought um, um, Astor from FutureFit uh, Foundation in, in here. Um, uh, a quick thing about us, if you haven't heard from us, this is a, a fourth in a series of webinars on um, where before we talked about uh, science-based targets, about scope one and two and about scope three. Now we're discussing the new taxonomy. Um, on the left, we are Nordic Sustainability. We are a Copenhagen-based uh, sustainability strategy consultancy. Um, with the idea or with the mission that 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 sustainability needs to be much more integrated into into company strategies, um, we work with some of the um, uh, major uh, companies in Denmark, some of the foundations and international organizations like the Global Compact here, the Asian Development Bank, um, and uh, and 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 try to of course uh, imagine and help our clients to a world where actually. Uh, in line with planetary boundaries. And again, with Astra here from FutureFit uh, Foundation, which is a um, UK-based uh, non nonprofit that has uh, developed over the past years what we think is one of the best, um, or well, the best uh, sustainability management framework that, that is out there for companies to actually integrate sustainability internally. Um, we have a relatively simple agenda for you today. Um, again, I have Astra with me from, from FutureFit and um, my, my colleague, Michelle, um, uh, and uh, Michelle will, will kick us off with a small introduction to the taxonomy um, to talk, kind of cover the groundwork um, and the main, main concepts. I'll be talking a little bit more about the implications for businesses, and then we'll talk about, um, uh, or Astor will, will, will guide us over to, to how to use the future advantage, benchmark or how it may be useful uh, when managing the EU taxonomy approach. And then we've left uh, quite a bit of time for Q&A. Um, that doesn't mean give, that we are able to answer all your questions because a lot of the EU taxonomy, of course, isn't still fine, uh, fully finalized. Um, but do uh, shoot away. Unfortunately, so many people that we can't allow everyone to have their videos on. Um, but but we hope you use the the Q and A function that's that's um, that's there to um, to ask as many questions as and, and a wide variety of questions that you may have. Um, we're also recording this session, um, so just so you know, it will be uh, available afterwards. With that being said, Mich uh, Michelle, would you like to kick us off? Great, thank you, Sven. I'm just gonna share my screen with you all. All right, so let's start off with what is the EU taxonomy? Well, the term taxonomy is a science of naming, describing, and classifying. In the case of the EU taxonomy, it's the naming of business activities and it's describing what thresholds and criteria specifically that they need to meet in order to be considered substantially contributing to the European Union's climate and policy, uh, climate policy and sustainability goals. Um, so it's been described as a living dictionary and I really like that comparison because um, the word dictionary for me evokes a feeling of something that is very uh, certain, it's a reference document, which is exactly what the taxonomy is. It's a, it has a lot of very specific information in it. Um, and it creates a sense of certainty through definitions about what is considered good enough to be sustainable. Um, and with that, it creates greater certainty in the market um, for this wild west of corporate sustainability and sustainability investing that it really was never there before. So that's very unique. And living because it is being um, updated this is because it's being updated to um, keep in track, keep in line with uh, new scientific developments, with new innovations for technology, but also to be made more strict in line with 2050 climate goals. So now that we have um, that definition out of the way, let's understand a bit more of the policy ecosystem that the taxonomy is part of. So um, you may all likely be familiar already with the EU Green Deal, which is, of course, the uh, set of policy, policy initiatives to create a sustainable economy in Europe with the overarching goal of climate neutrality by 2050 and an interim target of a 55% reduction by 2030 in greenhouse gas emissions. So that is only nine years away. Uh, and that's a major restructuring of society that's going to need to happen in order to achieve 
these goals. And it's not just um, emissions, of course, it's a, it's a broad reaching um, policy initiatives that span across all major sectors, also known as the green transition. Um, and so to achieve this, a lot of investment is going to be needed. One trillion by 2030 has been estimated. And of that, there'll be needed, there will need to be a greater mobilization of private funding as well. Um, in particular, 279 billion has been estimated. So where is that going to come from? Well, the answer to that in part is a, the action plan on financing sustainable growth. It's a comprehensive strategy to connect finance with sustainability. And there are 10 key actions that make up this plan, action plan. And we're not gonna unfortunately go into those today. But what is important to understand is the EU taxonomy is really the cornerstone of this action plan because it defines those um, business activities that are considered to substantially contribute to the EU Green Deal. And therefore, those are the activities that um, financing needs to be funneled towards in order to achieve the Green Deal. And it serves as a foundation for the rest of the actions by creating that common definition. So now that we have a bit of a background on the policy ecosystem um, of the EU taxonomy, um, you might be wondering who exactly is it going to affect first? Well, financial institutions for one um, will have to disclose the percentage of many of their financial products that are taxonomy aligned and on a compliant explained basis for all others. Also large companies will have to have mandatory disclosure requirements about the percentage of their um, turnover and CAPEX and also OPEX that is um, taxonomy aligned. But those right now are those companies already required to report under the non-financial reporting directive, public interest companies and listed companies. So the EU Commission is working on how to include SMEs in this in a way that isn't overly burdensome in terms of reporting requirements, but they're not included right now. However, the EU taxonomy is still created to have a trickle down effect and will affect supply chains in terms of this new definition of what is sustainable. Um, also, it's going to have, even though it's a, of course a European, it's going to have a global, um, global reach. And that's because it's been already inspiring many countries to develop taxonomies of their own. So next, let's, let's dig into a bit of these economic activities that are covered by the EU taxonomy. So there are six environmental objectives that support the EU Green Deal. And within these, these contain um, the activities that are said to support those objectives or substantially contribute to them. Right now, climate change mitigation and adaptation are two objectives that have had their delegated acts released, meaning we have um, most of the activities already um, defined in those that substantially contribute to those objectives. And those already cover 80% of Europe's direct greenhouse gas emissions. So that's quite sizable. But of course, as we know, um, sustainability is more than just greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why there's four more objectives. There's sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources. There's transition to a circular economy. There's pollution prevention and control, as well as protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. So um, those remaining four objectives have yet to be released. So they're a bit uncertain. However, when assessing um, economic activities to understand if they are aligned in the taxonomy or not, they have to go through a three-step screening process and meet these three requirements of substantially contributing to one or more of these objectives listed here. They must cause no significant harm to the other objectives and they must meet minimum social safeguards. And for each activity, economic activity, the taxonomy documents um, describe in great detail exactly how those um, activities are to be screened. So here's an example of how taxonomy alignment can be um, disclosed for a company. Essentially, um, when looking at it, you'd have to look at the company's activities uh, as a percentage of their overall turnover, and then define if they are eligible for screening or not. Could they be in the taxonomy or considered to be uh, contributing su uh, substantially to those objectives. They have to go through this three-step screening process and they have to meet all three of those uh, steps. So if one of them is not met, then it's not taxonomy aligned. And then the final result is a percentage of turnover that is taxonomy aligned. Oops. So then um, taxonomy screening applied to investment portfolio. 
Um, investors are going to have to disclose the percentage of taxonomy alignment across their portfolio. And this gets a bit more complex because you're looking at all the companies within that portfolio and then their activities and a similar uh, three-step screenings process. Um, but of course, for each of those companies and their activities. So a challenge then arises when um, companies may not disclose all of their um, taxonomy. They might not have already disclosed on the taxonomy and then the investors have to do a type of screening themselves. Um, so this can get quite challenged in terms of data availability. So here are some upcoming dates for the taxonomy's implementation of notes. So uh, just one week ago, it was very exciting. We had the final version of the screening criteria release for climate mitigation and adaptation. And Sven will describe a bit more of the uh, developments around that. By the end of this year, we are um, hoping to see the completion of the technical screening criteria or the delegated acts for the remaining four environmental objectives. Then starting in 2022, disclosure will begin to be required for climate mitigation and adaptation. And organizations, I should note both financial organizations and companies will have to disclose um, by the end of that year. So they have the same deadlines. And then the next year, um, there's a, a year grace period to make up for those other objectives, uh, the remaining four objectives, and then disclosure will have to begin for those a, a year later. So to wrap us off, um, let's recap what the taxonomy is and is not according to some misconceptions that can be quite common. The taxonomy is a dynamic tool to enable the sustainable transition. It's going to become more strict over time and it's going to be updated. Um, and it's also science based. So it's based on the recommendations of a technical expert group set up by the European Commission, as well as the EU platform on sustainable finance. And it also carries with it a legal obligation to disclose for those actors that we talked about earlier. Um, this is very new. There's nothing that we've seen like this before. The fact that it's set out in level two European law is um, very um, innovative and um, exciting for sustainable, sustainable uh, disclosures. And the taxonomy is not a mandatory list to invest in or finance um, or divest from. Um, it rather, it creates greater transparency in the market. It's not an exhaustive list of business activities. Some uh, may never be included in the taxonomy if they don't substantially contribute uh, to the objectives, but that doesn't mean that those businesses don't have a role to play in reducing their operational emissions. Um, and it's also not a legal obligation that forces businesses to align. Rather, it's um, a market-based tool that is creating greater transparency and therefore causing a shift in the market at this time. And that's what Sven's going to explain more to us about right now. So I will pass the screen over to you, Sven. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll reshare my screen. Um, can you all see it? Yes. Oh, started at the beginning again. <laughs> Good. So now I'll be talking a little bit more about the, the uh, wider implications of the taxonomy. And I think, um, I mean, I'll start uh, somewhere quite at the beginning. I think one of the things we, we usually say when we meet, meet clients is that, you know, it, let's, let's, you know, let's be clear about it. If we talk about true, you know, a company being truly sustainable, so a company that, you know, acts within planetary boundaries, that is, that is uh, you know, uh, keeping its activities with, uh, under a 1.5 degree warming scenario um, that has a positive contribution, and has no significant negative impacts on, on, on environmental or, or social, social uh, areas. Um, so in a way, a taxonomy, you know, uh, at least in the, in the, in the, in the spirit of it, is taxonomy aligned company. Then most companies today, or all companies today are, are still very far away from that. And in our view, even sustainability leaders are very, very far away from that. We've gotten, of course, much, much better in re recent years, especially with developments such as the sci uh, science-based targets initiatives for CO2, um, but we're we're not close to managing sustainability as comprehensively as we need to to be, uh, to be able to 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 come to to truly truly sustainable companies, and that is something that we think the the taxonomy um, will get us a lot closer to being able to do. Um, 
And let me just describe, you know, why I think I think that's the case. Um, of course, you know, one there have been, you know, many as as, as Michelle said, many of the factors around the EU taxonomy are still not fully defined. We don't know fully what it looks like, um, but there have been different. Uh, surveys or different uh, studies where, where people have looked at what would it actually mean if we screen, in, as in this case, some of the major European indices? Can we see if we find, you know, to what degree uh, are the companies in these indices uh, uh, aligned to the EU taxonomy? And in this case, as uh, a study by, by German ministry, um, the sustainable finance survey that they've done, they found that um, between one and two percent of major European companies would actually be taxonomy aligned. Of course, that's that's a very small percentage, and that's of course what's what's scaring everybody right now, um, and and I think that's also what's causing much of the the fierce lobbying and disagreements on 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 many of the aspects of uh, that are that are covered in the uh, tax, tax, taxonomy, especially of course around around the the energy intensive sectors, um, gas, nuclear, but also forestry and and agriculture. And, and, you know, there are voices on the one hand that then will say, like, like uh, a member of the EPP in the European Parliament, uh, that's an ineffective plan that will, uh, 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 is unrealistic and will penalize energy uh, intensive industries. Um, but at the same time, we have, you know, uh, we have a strong commitment by the Commission to a, a uh, an, to underlying science of the, the taxonomy that is building, being built. And, and we see that also in a, in a, you know, in a backlash of the scientific community. This was a letter, uh, Revenge of the Scientists, uh, from the EU Commission uh, in March, where they said, look, if you, if you, you, know, if you water this down, um, uh, we will be in clear contradiction to climate science. We will not make it. Uh, and you will take out the, the, the scientific foundation from this. And it seems from, again, from all the commitments that, that science is here to stay. Um, I mean, generally, we do see, you know, of course, there, there, there are several options of how it can now go forward. There's still the option that it might all fall apart, in which case we're we're all much worse off um, than we are than, than 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 we would be if it if it comes into force. But of course, there there's you know we 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 see the scenario where the taxonomy will will largely stay in place the way it is, and in that case, it will bring seismic shifts to you know corporate sustainability performance um, demands. Um, but even if it is slightly watered down, which which might be inevitable in some of the key sectors in order to, to get agreement. Um, even then, it's still much more ambitious than than anything that is out there today in terms of regulation. And that's what's what's important for sustainability management and and of course for 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 management of uh, companies to understand. And that's where some of the, the, the usual tools being used, the usual reporting tools just won't be nearly enough. Um, now, I want to talk about three shifts that that I think you know embody this change and that that make the shift so so or potentially so dramatic, um, and and the first one is that is this move to no harm and the positive contribution. So where companies have to show that al along those six EU taxonomy objectives that Michelle mentioned, they have uh, you know they they cause no significant harm and they have a positive contribution to at least one of them. That is, you know, of course, a huge difference to to what we see currently in sustainability management. Um, you know, most companies that we see are still in that game of, you know, relative reductions. Right? We continue to grow, and we continue to grow our material footprint, but at least we're getting ten percent more efficient for each unit of economic output. That's not going to fly anymore in the future, right? Um, and and you know, we've seen the massive shifts, of course, with the science-based targets initiative on uh, on CO two. Um, and that's what's also embodied in the first two objectives that, that, that are already much clearer. But the rest of the objectives, it's, it's very clear that it'll, it'll, it'll need, they'll need a much wider uh, 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 breadth of, of indicators for companies to measure and understand their performance. With. So that will bring a big shift for you to show as a company that you're not causing harm. Likewise, positive contributions will not need to be much more justifiable. You cannot simply, as, as what's happening today in many, well, at least here in the Nordic countries, um, uh, you know, pick some of the SDGs and 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 uh, outline uh, on a higher level uh, quite undefined your your positive contribution that will be difficult to maintain so this is one of the major shifts the other major shift is of course that um we'll be linking sustainability performance to uh, revenue of a company um as as uh, michelle has already brought some of the examples on the left there's another one you know a company that has certain activities uh, where where each of the activities is uh, you know is is well um, uh, is is, uh, is is more or less aligned, um, and and you know a, a company might then be you know forty percent in, in their revenue aligned to the taxonomy, 
Um, what, what this means is that finally we're connecting um, sustainability performance with the share, you know, with, a, with an evaluation of the share of a company that is actually sustainable. And that will also bring a big shift. And, and will mean that many, you know, so, so-called sustainable actions that are that are common today just won't be acceptable anymore. Um, we all know that one that company that has, you know, has has left the, most of their portfolio intact, but has developed that one sustainable or so-called sustainable product, right? Which 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 likely usually only has a small percentage of the revenue, right? We all know the companies that are focusing very much on reducing one of the impacts, for example, plastics in their products while disregarding many of the other impacts, water, for example, water use, right? Um, we're, we're also know, you know, uh, probably all know examples of companies that are, uh, you know, sustainifying the company, the cu customers uh, facing aspects of their products and services, but not the background activities. You know, in the spirit of, of the taxonomy, that will be very difficult to maintain. Instead, we'll have to address uh, sustainability much more widely across the portfolio in order to, to, to get, a, um, uh, get a sufficient score and, and not be penalized by financial markets. Um, we will need to look at uh, legacy products as well, because they will be part of a, uh, a crucial part of the solution, right? If you have uh, 15,000 um, SKUs in a company, then you'll have to deal with those 15,000 SKUs. And that, of course, also means that that uh, in in the end we, we might see you know a phase out of whole product lines that that can't easily can't easily transitioned. Third shift I want to um, talk about is, is is the enforcing mechanism or that tightening mechanism. Uh, Michelle said already that the EU taxonomy is a living organism, right? And and what we will see is that standards, of course, will tighten or are meant to tighten over time because the way um, it works is that basically the EU taxonomy is setting a threshold based on kind of the best available te technology at a given time. And then when better technology comes available, it'll increase or tighten that threshold. And what we've outlined here is just a, you know, an illustrative example of cement production. So when we look at a company that produces cement and they right now maybe you know uh, at producing uh, a ton of cement with 450 kilograms of co2 then right now they would be taxonomy compliant um a company that's that's uh, six you know producing ton of cement with 600 uh, kilograms of co2 would be above that and would be not compliant now what we'll see over time is as better technology comes available um, especially, it, it, we, we will see in disruptions in the industry because, of course, there will be both a regulatory push um, that that the EU, tech, the EU says, you know, we're tightening the the, the, the requirements. Um, uh, you know, in the future, we will have to be below 150 kilograms of CO, of, of, of CO2 per ton. Um, but as well, of course, financial actors, when they know that, are going to be identifying and trying to put their money to those companies that are ready for that transition. So as you know, outlined here, uh, between 2025 and 2030 or 2040 and 2045, we might see these technology disruptions um, during the tight tightening cycles of, of, uh, of the regulation. So pioneers of, of lower impact technologies will be much more rewarded than they are right now. Um, and of course, the EU is is, is realizing that, and and the answer is uh, the answer is basically uh, uh, this is one of the rapporteurs from the EU platform sustainable finance. We will all ha all have to get there in any case, and there's a competitive advantage for first movers. Um, now, all of this together means that we need to think of sustainability management differently. And if I was, you know, a manager, and unfortunately, we I think we still have a, a bit of a curve. Uh, uptake as well in, in, in getting all of management across all of all companies to understand the, the realities of all and, and the difficulty of, of, of going on these shifts. But, but um, you know, the um, uh, companies and, and managers need to understand these, these wider shifts that will come from this. Um, and that, of course, means, as, as we already said, you know, you, companies will need to have a much more systemic lens to their impacts um, across the key impact areas. Uh, we will need to be able to manage a much wider range of sustainability parameters across our entire portfolio, not just new products. Um, you know, I, I wrote a little bit provocatively, ESG will stop being a farce um, because right now ESG, you know, information uh, from companies, we all know this examples about uh, uh, tobacco companies or oil companies scoring quite high. Uh, on um, uh, ESG data, you know, we can, uh, investors will be much better able to differentiate between companies based on sustainability performance and know through through CapEx and OPEX numbers what uh, uh, what companies are transitioning and which ones aren't. Those requirements will spread 
um, uh, most likely because of course if you're if you have the cho choice to to invest into uh, into a sustainable company or another company that's you know that's small that that might not have the same regulatory standards but um, you just don't have that transparency on the data then then why, what, of course you're going to invest in the one that you know is on a good tr sustainability trajectory. Um, again, there'll be a market pull and a regulatory push, regulatory push that towards best-in-class technologies, um, where where companies will see a disruption risk and will see, I think, more companies having their codec moment where they'll miss the boat on on uh, on on technology. Uh, now, this this next slide is a little bit a little bit out there still, but uh, I, I you know you can you can take this further and think about you know if we um, if we look at the you know on the one side side the, the product footprint of our of, of what we of what we create, and the on the other on on the other axis the you know the social impact of of our products, you might you might envision a future where where it, you know with with better data it'll be much clearer for for investors to know um, you know uh, is is of course is this uh, is a certain product or or uh, service creating a high social impact and what is the associated environmental footprint. And it'll be it'll, it'll likely become much more difficult to justify a product's footprint um, with if it doesn't have a strong societal impact, um, especially if it does have a high footprint. So we might see, as in this example, that you know, on a high footprint level, um, you know, over time, only life crucial, health related, uh, or you know, temporary uh, uh, solutions will be will be getting uh, will not be penalized with access to funding. Uh, or regulation, right? In the medium footprint column, we may see that there's a little bit more wiggle room, but over time, there's also pressure to move, of course, to the low impact category. Um, and and you know, many many companies that can't clearly articulate their 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 positive impacts will see them you know, will need to show that they don't have a negative product footprint. And again, over a much wider variety of metrics, um, as is outlined on the right. Now, what does this mean? Uh, we, I think, we're we most of us know we're, we're not quite ready, um, and that's that's okay. Um, of course, we again the the main message we we want to have here is that we need to uh, move organizations to transform in line with systemic requirements, and of course, you will need to prepare the basics of trying to stay ahead of of the regulation, understand you know create a awareness inter internally and capacity to understand what that means capacity to understand to, to understand where you are as a company uh, and your alignment and you need to integrate that with reporting and management tools and uh, and 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 automate some of the report reporting and um, more crucially though um, you will need to to uh, to get an understanding on the organization towards longer term transformations in the sectors and be aware that you know when if a competitor has a much more um, a much lower footprint uh, technology out there that will affect you much more than it has in the past and we'll see more of course iteration of these cycles these technological side cycles that will impact companies um, and and as such of course that has to be integrated into internal policies governance systems and, and planning and then be anchored as a standard in, in organizations um, now with all of that said, for us, you know, the real question is not just how to be compliant; it is how to systemically address sustainability in your organization. And and you know, as an organization, you should ask yourself how can we truly start managing sustainability to what a what a, a sustainable endpoint. And that's why I'll hand over to Astrid because I do think she has one of the uh, best ways of of uh, starting on that journey right now. I Thank see there's some questions coming in. Please keep them uh, keep them firing, and we'll, we'll answer them afterwards. Okay. Thank you, Sven. I will just try to hijack the screen here. Okay. Um, well, so yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Estel, uh, and I work very closely with Future Fit. On, on many things, but, uh, but mostly on building and, and refining uh, our suite of uh, business tools. So to so those of you who may not know, FutureFit is a UK registered charity. We are a small size team, but uh, we have a wide reach and uh, mainly via all of our accredited partners around the world. Nordic Sustainability obviously uh, being one of them, one of our favorites. Um, at FutureFit, we, we like to say that we don't forecast, uh, we backcast. And what I mean by that is that we always start with the end in mind. 
And so we believe that for everyone on earth to have uh, the opportunity to lead healthy and fulfilling lives, we really need an economy that's environmentally restorative, socially just, and economically inclusive. And so we like to say that our work really involves around translating social, environmental, and system sciences into practical tools that can really help companies um, of all shapes and sizes chart a path towards um, this kind of society. Now, as, um, as Sven and Michelle has outlined, moving one's organization that's, uh, to a trajectory that's in line with the taxonomy, but also with broader system requirements, really is becoming a, a business imperative at this point. And so we believe that our framework, uh, the Future Fit Business Benchmark, may be a really good, uh, good way to get started. Now, thankfully, we're, we're not the only ones who think that, uh, that this is useful. Uh, we've worked closely with a range of companies and investors uh, to stress test the benchmark and ensure its uh, usability. And so just here, uh, here you'll see some of the companies and investors that we've worked with closely uh, as members of our development council, um, uh, uh, who's really helped us shape our work uh, over the last uh, seven years. So, we have long uh, advocated that a system view is needed to identify sustainable business practices. Now, as Sven also pointed to, uh, arguably standard practice today is to kind of hone in on, on the set of issues that are financially most salient at any one point in time, and then assess and report on those um, uh, in isolation and to the possible exclusion of other types of, of impacts. Um, luckily or, or um, positively, uh, the EU taxonomy uh, is recognizing that positive impacts, uh, positive contributions uh, must not come at the expense of significant uh, negative impacts elsewhere, both upstream and downstream of value chains. While this is really good, obviously this can also complicate the analysis quite a bit because we really have to start to look for those interdependencies. Now, the future fit business benchmark is encouraging the same kind of, uh, of systems thinking. But where the taxonomy is, is defining an environmentally sustainable activity, uh, the benchmark kind of goes one step above to define a truly sustainable company or what we will call a, a future fit company. Um, as such, uh, the benchmark at a high level fully encompasses the six environmental objectives that Michelle outlined, as well as the minimum social safeguards. But it also goes beyond that to identify additional social and environmental considerations uh, that stakeholders and, and future regulators are likely to be paying attention to. Now, naturally for, for, for a detailed uh, alignment exercise, we'll have to wait for the taxonomy to kind of take its final form. But it's our expectation that the benchmark can prove useful in, in at least two ways. One is conceptual, uh, in that it can, it can kind of act as the um, umbrella framing that can bring together uh, the EU taxonomy, but also uh, other or additional imperatives like the Sustainable Development Goals into one shared long-term strategic vision within and, uh, and across companies. The other is more practical. Companies that begin to undertake the kind of holistic approach to impact assessment that, that the benchmark is encouraging will begin to build up a really clear picture of its data and information landscape. So knowing what you know, who knows it, as well as knowing what you don't know is a really good starting point to kind of identify and explore taxonomy alignment. But more importantly as well, it, it also sets an organization up to be responsive to changing requirements, both within and beyond the, uh, the taxonomy. So what is the Future Fit Business Benchmark? At its core, uh, it's a way for companies and investors to assess, measure, and manage the impact of their activities, both positive and negative. We've built it based on leading scientific expert and organizational thinking within each distinct topic area, 
but always with the focus of identifying uh, the markers of true sustainability, so to speak. Now, the benchmark offers a way of, of identifying and measuring and communicating positive contributions, uh, including the extent to which those contributions are aligned with revenue generating activities. So this is what maps very nicely onto the environmental objectives. In addition, uh, it identifies a set of business specific social and environmental uh, break even thresholds, as we'd like to call it. These are long term ambitious goals, which combine to define what it takes to become a future fit, uh, a future fit company. So that's a company that do no harm or is truly sustainable. Now, for both positive pursuits and for each break even goal, um, the benchmark offers information, insights, and actionable steps that a company can take to kind of measure and make progress towards them. It's accompanied by a, a disclosure uh, template, which we refer to as the statement of progress. And that's for those companies that are looking to communicate both their ambition and their performance externally and on an ongoing basis. It complements other initiatives be it the SDGs, planetary boundaries, ILO standards, circularity principles, and so forth. And, uh, and yeah, as, as said, I mean, we expect that to be very strong alignment with the, with the taxonomy. So it's our expectation that companies who are actively using the benchmark it will have a majority of the data it needs to understand and, and disclose alignment. But of course, we will also actively work uh, towards ensuring that that is indeed the case as we continue our own uh, development. So, so just to, uh, to sum up, I guess the, the purpose of the benchmark is really to encourage companies to be ahead of the game through the proactive management of key information in order to be responsive to both current as well as future societal and regulatory pressures. While at the same time also providing the mechanisms through which to communicate those uh, contributions towards these shared societal objectives, be it climate change mitigation, adaptation, circularity, resource stewardship, or, or social uh, well-being. So how can you, uh, how can you engage with the, with the benchmark? Um, there are many ways in which you can engage with, with us, but I'll just focus in on a couple here. Um, first of all, our, our uh, content, uh, core content is freely available online. So you can uh, visit our website and download all the, uh, the action guides and all the information there. Um, but uh, we'll really uh, encourage you to, to also consider joining our community of change makers. Um, the change maker community is really a place where we bring together sustainability and business professionals around the future fit business benchmark. And in there, you'll find exclusive resources, practical tools, regular events, and just um, input from the future fit team on queries. And so it's really just a space to connect and cross pollinate across organizations and, and, and everyone's most uh, welcome to join us. It's very accessible. Now, one resource which is currently in the community and which will be live uh, by the end of May, so just unfortunate timing here, um, but that's our online learning hub. And the online learning hub contains all the benchmark guidance in an easily accessible and, and shareable format. Uh, and this is also um, what we will continue to build out on uh, as we go forward, adding additional resources, FAQs, and, 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 and links um, for each of these distinct topics that the, that the benchmark addresses. Um, in addition, we will soon niche uh, be launching a beta release version of what we call the Future Fit Management Dashboard. And the intent of the dashboard is to make it easier for companies to gather data and measure progress for each of the benchmark topics. And we hope to have that out in the community for limited testing by, by Q4. And we just believe that both of these tools are, are really good uh, ways to kind of start to come to grips with not only what's needed for taxonomy compliance, but what the ultimate aim can look like for companies that really want to be at the forefront of sustainability. Now, um, yeah, in addition uh, to our work with businesses, you know, um, 
we do have a network of accredited partners like Nordic Sustainability. So if you don't want to engage with us, there are others out there that are very help, uh, um, ready to kind of help companies that are looking to either just dip a toe in the water or just fully deep dive on, on all things future fit. So, um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Sven. Unmute button. Great. Thank you so much, Astrid. Uh, thanks so much for, for the intro here. Um, and I think what is, as you already said, what's what's really different about this is that you're, you know, you're able to set as a company that long term sustainability goal, and then hopefully, um, uh, at times leapfrog uh, some of those technology, those those compliance cycles where you're just trying to to meet the next hurdle. Um, we have a range of questions here, and, and please keep uh, free to uh, feel free to, to keep um, keep firing them. Um, I think, uh, Michelle, you already answered a few of them uh, regarding what companies it it, it, um, it applies to. I think there's, there's also a question that you answered on whether the EU taxonomy includes anything on activities that are harmful to the environment rather than sustainable. And I think you mentioned rightly that there's a lot of discussions on going on there, you know, what is it if we define some green activities, what does it then mean for the rest of the activities? Are they automatically brown or have we just not found a way yet to technically describe them and it's a little bit of one of those downsides where right now uh, quite a lot of uh, economic activities still fall outside of that but but as as michelle said and i thought it was worth iterating there are a lot of discussions about how to handle though those and whether to you know include uh, a brown category or shades of green that you see you know this is slightly more sustainable but, but this is still pretty good um and that's one of those those discussions that have been had um i think there are some we have a range of questions on, on very different topics. Maybe we'll do uh, one, one taxonomy related question and then a future related question and, and, and alternate that way. I think the uh, uh, one question we got is, you know, how does the taxonomy disclosure position GRI reporting? And, and I think from our point of view, um, of course, you know, in a lot of ways, um, for, for, from some of the areas, we, we don't fully know, we're not fully able to give that answer yet because so much of it's undefined. I think the two, um, uh, uh, the, the the main issue with with GRI is that in a way it's backward looking, right? It's it's um, it's looking at uh, uh, what is your performance today. It doesn't it doesn't extrapolate in the future. It doesn't tell you where you're going to go in the future. So it doesn't really, uh, of course, help you understand where you're going that much. And also, a lot of times, the GRI information that's generated is is is, is not quite specific enough. Um, to answer some of these the indicators that will be uh, uh, that the financial institutes will, will ask you for, of course the the EU taxonomy is also built on um, on trying to you know uh, to get companies to you know map themselves to key uh, technological developments right. So in that way, um, it is uh, we see GI uh, information still be could be complementary um, to to the answer in, in the end, but of course not not um, yeah not not fully fully able to answer the questions that will come. Um, and of course, there's also now a lot of discussions about uh, GRI and, and some of the big organizations that are that are uniting to, to create stronger frameworks there. Um, I see, um, <clears throat> sorry, I see a, a question here, um, uh, whether there are any advantages of the future fit compared to being B Corp certified. And there seems um, uh, like there's a lot of alignment there, so I can just talk to that quickly. Um, so, so yeah, so we uh, we often get the the comparison between B Corp and I think we we all agree that's in a fantastic organization. But I think our our uh, our approaches are, are complementary; they're not uh, in competition. So um, you know what the B Corp uh, certification does is that you know if you get a, enough points, then you 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 can become classified as a B Corp. And then what um, Future Fit is really all about is not certifying someone as as sustainable or not. It's really about the journey towards that ultimate aim that we know we need to get to, which is much, much more ambitious and, and for many of the goals beyond, uh, beyond, the, I guess the, um, beyond reach within the next um, few years. So I think what we, um, what we can do is that we can, we can put, I guess, the, the B Corp certification, but also the other kind of disclosure uh, frameworks out there like GRI, SAS, et cetera, et cetera, in the context of what we believe is really required long-term to become truly sustainable. So again, I think that is where we, we kind of sit one level above to be act as a kind of umbrella framing that can bring these different initiatives together. 
Well said. And um, just one question that came up here as well about the taxonomy was about the first draft technical screening um, criteria for the circular economy objective. Um, and those are actually intended to be released by the end of this year, by December. However, um, we found with the other uh, screening criteria, the delegated acts for the first two objectives, those um, ended up being delayed. So we can cross our fingers and hope they'll be released then. Great. Thanks. There was another future fit related question around biodiversity um, from Matthias Astrid. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, let me. Um, oh, where is where, where, So, where do we see biodiversity coming into the into future fit? Uh, um, it's more difficult to measure, right? And it's it's more than GHG and waste. Um, so, so it'd be interesting to understand how that's anchored. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we have several, um, several goals that focuses in on, on, on biodiversity of, of uh, in different ways. One is around the fiscal presence of, of organizations. The other one is, is centered around our management of natural resources. So insofar as possible, what we've tried to do when tackling these quite difficult issues is to draw on um, the, the, the leading resources that we can find out there. Um, and then try to translate that into kind of measurable markers. Um, so, so I think if you were, if you want to look more uh, into it, then you know, go on our website and, and identify, uh, look at the um, break-even goals specifically around uh, fiscal presence. Great, um, perfect. I think there was one more question. Uh, maybe we'll just do. Uh around the circle. I think from, from Frederick uh, on who will police taxonomy reporting and screening, you know, will it just filter into existing reporting frameworks? I do think that there is a, a strong alignment push, you know, just like FutureFit looking out to how, how, you know, can we make sure we're fully aligned to make it easy for companies? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the big uh, reporting organizations are doing the same. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, all the, all the big four accountancies will be very happy to, to help uh, integrate, you know, with, with the reporting structures. I think in terms of policing, I mean, they, you know, the, um, I think it, it, a, a big part of the policing aspect will also come through, of course, the financial community, because companies will need to show where the data comes from that they, uh, you know, that they, uh, based on which they, they um, show their taxonomy alignment. So, so I think it will very much come um, through the financial sector that way, that there will just be requirements on, on how the data is being reported. Can I, can I add to that as well, Sven? So, um, so yeah, it, um, we've, we've, we've thought a lot about how to make the, the, the benchmark assurable. Because, of course, we know that, you know, that, the, that there's not, um, uh, you know, there's a great degree of trust involved in, 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 in when companies are saying that something is aligned or not. And, and at, we expect that at, uh, at, uh, investors are really going to be looking for assured data so that they can trust the information that's coming out. And so what we've tried to do is, is, uh, is make sure that for each of the, uh, of the, um, of the break-even goals, we have a whole section on assurance. And so really trying to, I guess, advise company, help companies to understand the kinds of you know, behind the scenes actions that might be good to take in order to prepare Pair for data and, and, and analysis to be assurable. And I think that's going to be true also for the, for the taxonomy, uh, maybe not immediately, but as, as it kind of matures. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Michelle, would you like to take the next one? Sure. Um, I see that we have a question about the advice that we could have for businesses to get started with the working on the taxonomy. And um, I think that if anyone's interested in learning more about taxonomy, um, right now, for the first two criteria, there are some uh, a very detailed and Excel tool, which at first is a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of information in there, but um, businesses are interested in looking into what kind of activities are covered. Uh, keeping in mind that Excel, that Excel tool is actually not updated um, in the latest release of the two delegated acts, but I'm sure another one is coming up soon. Um, but it gives a good criteria, a good information of all about the very specific uh, criteria that are required and, and a good picture. So um, I think it's good just to start working on that right away and starting to dig into it. Great. I think there's more taxonomy related questions now. I, I might just take one. I think there's a question on how the taxonomy will align with uh, science-based targets uh, for companies. 
I mean, since the um, since the taxonomy and and please feel free to add Michelle if you've read anything about direct alignment. But since the taxonomy outlines what activities specifically are sustainable, right? Um, uh, we it's it's not directly uh, uh, connected in that way. But we would of course assume that any company, because science-based targets is is kind of the reference standard right now for emissions reductions. Any ta company that is working with um, science-based targets in a uh, in and 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 reducing emissions uh, ambitiously enough will should be fine uh, from 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 the view of the EU taxonomy. Um, yeah, I think just to add to that, I mean, with all these questions about does it align with different um, reporting standards, it, it's not created to align with reporting standards, uh, of course, but then, for example, um, SBTI being very ambitious, um, companies that are already working with it will have better quality data and be already taking more actions to reduce their emissions. Um, and so, therefore, there are, it will be an easier time for them when they begin working with the taxonomy. Um, I can see that there's um, there's a question around uh, what what we see as the most problematic data gaps for, for disclosure under the taxonomy, um, which I think um, I can uh, I can I can talk to uh, a little bit just from our experiences at FutureFit. Uh, so so I think when when we work with organizations, um, oftentimes you know the, the, there's a it's a non-overlapping. <laughs> The, the circle when it comes to what a company has identified as as uh, as financially material, and then what is uh, potentially considered material to society and the planet, right? And so, because the taxonomy is really focusing in on on this, you know, the impacts to environment and planet rather than what is financially material to the company, some of the data that that um, that speaks to to the former but not the latter might be uh, might not be ready at hand for those uh, for, for many companies um so so i think it's a, a useful exercise is, is, is again just to to think uh, i mean it's always useful to think about what's financially material as, as a way to understand how to prioritize etc cetera, etc cetera, but really go beyond that to understand you know, the broader system requirements again and then once you do that that's where you probably will find that you have to close some data gaps in your organization and the, the whole, I, I think the whole focus on, on trying to get the discussion science-based, right? To, to, to make sure you cover all the ways in which you have an impact on the different different metrics. I think that's that's the key. And that's sometimes the, 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 the where, where traditional materiality approaches are lacking. Mm. Good. Um, there's a question of, um, so in effect, if a company is not sustainable as per EU taxonomy, then capital markets will not provide funding to them, right? Um, I think I think it's a difficult one. I mean, of course, you know, we 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 know now that you know oil companies are are, are or we've been knowing for a while oil companies are not sustainable, and still they've received quite a bit of funding, right? But of course, um, I think as as investors make more experience with you know, stranded assets where they invest, for example, in oil and then realize and um, there's just huge write downs because uh, because it's, it's part of the old economy. Um, uh, we do think that that investors will be much quicker at adjusting their investments towards uh, towards sustainable uh, towards the sustainable economy. So I, I think it'll be uh, there'll be a, a, a stronger and 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 immediate response from investors. But of course, on an individual case basis, uh, it's, it's always difficult to say. Right. We also have a question about how the taxonomy addresses um, high carbon intensive sectors compared to companies or sectors that enable carbon reducing or uptake solutions. Um, and it's interesting because we talk a lot about the activities themselves that contribute to the six objectives, but the taxonomy also includes um, transitional activities, specifically those that um, have no technological or economically feasible low carbon alternatives. Uh, but still support the transition to climate neutrality, and that is um, is addressed in the taxonomy. Of course, they also include these enabling activities, which enable other activities to make a contribution to one or more of those objectives. So those activities in themselves may not be low carbon, but they help um, the other activities and the transition to an overall um, carbon neutral society. So those are taken account, and those criteria will be updated um, when new technologies emerge that can make those um, sectors hopefully um, less uh, environmentally uh, harmful in, in themselves. I think there's a very interesting point that, that was also made right now that uh, the 
uh, new taxonomy is still a, a delegated act, right? Um, so it's, it still has to be, you know, fully approved and, and there's likely we might see some laxing of the standards by the, by the member states um, to, to get agreement on them. And while I definitely think that that is true, no doubt we'll, uh, you know, we're moving in one direction on the sustainability agenda because with the, you know, the climate targets that have also been set in the EU, there's no way to get around that scientific foundation uh, otherwise, we'll have much bigger project problems than taxonomy alignment uh, in a few years. So, so I do think it's true. Um, and for specific sectors, that's why it's important that you monitor the developments in your sector. Uh, but, but, but again, being ahead of the game is probably probably a good 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 thing, no matter what. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's a there's a question here around if you are a future fit pioneer, how can you utilize the break even goals in in relation to the um, EU taxonomy of reporting? So, um, so, um, so I just want to make a note, I guess, on the um, what we mean by uh, pioneer, future fit pioneer. So that's a um, basically we've we're we've um, rallying up a group of of companies that are really committed to the journey of future fitness, and not just committed, but also to committed to disclosing progress. And 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 those we just refer to as our future fit pioneers. And so those are really companies that have um, started. Uh, looking into um, how they are how they're performing and their ambitions across all of these different goals. So in terms of how to utilize that analysis in relation to the EU taxonomy, I would say I would say for now just immediately again it comes down to just um, understanding uh, if you have done this you probably have a very good sense for uh, your operations and how you're faring on each of the environmental objectives but also on each of the underlying uh, I guess the technical screening criteria uh, for your activities. So I think the exercise there is then to translate that into to, to what that means for taxonomy alignment. Now our, it's our hope that uh, as we kind of progress uh, further with our management dashboard in time, it might be possible for you to, uh, you know, do your future fit uh, pioneer report, but in addition, kind of translate that into what does that mean for taxonomy alignment, but also, you know, what does that mean for our um, contribution to the SDGs, both positive and negative, and, and other frameworks out there that, uh, that are important. So um, this is something that we are looking at making sure that it's as easy as possible, but, uh, but it probably will be, um, be a, a little bit before we get there, because we also need the EU taxonomy to get there first. There's an, an interesting, slightly cheeky question here, but I think that is worth mentioning. And the question is, how do we categorize pharma companies which force high priced drugs and put lawsuits against generic drug makers? And, and the reason why I want to pick, take this, this question off also is that um, I think it's, it's worth uh, noting that, of course, the EU taxonomy is looking at right now mostly at environmental issues. Um, they're, they're, they're looking more into also refining the social social areas of, of the taxonomy, adding those. But of course, there are certain, there, there, there's still a lot of behaviors of companies that will not be uh, uh, under EU taxonomy scrutiny, at least. But I think as, you know, for example, that's also why we like working with the EU taxonomy framework, because, uh, sorry, with the future framework, because, for example, ethical behavior is covered as, as part of, of being a responsible business um, in that framework. And it's, it's something that, would, that companies would have to have to have to manage. And, and again, I think as, as investors start getting better at um, at understanding, uh, you know, a, a company's purpose across a variety of metrics in the world, they will there will also be more disciplining uh, uh, penalties uh, in terms of financial access to, to to those kinds of behaviors. I think it's uh, it's nine thirty. Um, we still have eighty nine participants. Um, I mean, there's a, a, a few more questions. Some of them are, are quite specific. Uh, for example, on the elaborate, uh, on the discussions on, on forestry and bioenergy, I think they're a little bit too specific to go in here. Um, uh, let's, let's have a dialogue maybe after that, um, uh, Anna. And um, I think otherwise, Michelle or Astrid, if you have one last, last question you want to answer. Um, otherwise, I think we'll... we'll I think that's, that's good for me. Good. Yeah, I, I'm not seeing any more future fit related questions, uh, Sven, on this. I think it's a difficult one for us. Yeah. <laughs> so feel free, of course, to reach out uh, and uh, we might take some of these more detailed questions um, afterwards. Feel free to um, reach out if you have any other questions. And of course, if you, if you need any support, 
Uh, but otherwise, we hope you have a great day, a great week, and we hope to see you at the, at the next webinar. And um, good luck getting uh, in internal uh, EU taxonomy awareness in your organization. Bye-bye. And thanks, Astrid, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.